Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Advanced Thermal Management Solutions for Automobiles, Design Consideration and Product Applications, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and TechBriefs Media Group. I'm Billy Hurley, Associate Editor with TechBriefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenters will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation, and those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Pete Ritt is ACT's Vice President of Technical Services. ACT's technical services business provides thermal consulting, design, and analysis to a variety of industries, including medical devices. Mr. Ritt is a former RCA Thompson executive, where he most recently was manager of strategic programs and business manager for the Lancaster R&D Center. In that role, he was responsible for developing technologies, processes, and products for scale-up and commercialization. He has been granted over 20 patents and holds degrees in chemical engineering from the University of Notre Dame and an MBA from Shippensburg University. Also on the line is Rich Bonner, manager of custom products. Rich has been with ACT for over seven years. He has served as principal investigator on multiple government and industrial R&D programs involving advanced thermal management. The thermal topics have included two-phase heat transfer, nanoscale coatings, thermal storage, junction level cooling, and jet impingement. He has also served as a technical lead on many technical services programs, including aerospace, defense, medical, and commercial electronics cooling programs. He is currently a chemical engineering doctoral candidate at Lehigh University, where he also holds a master's and bachelor's degree. So at this time, I'd like to hand the webcast over to our first speaker, Pete Ritt. Pete? Thank you, Billy. I'm Pete Ritt, and along with Rich Bonner, we are delighted to be with you. For today's webinar, we'd like to present some potentially new thermal management technologies for design engineers to consider when solving challenging thermal problems. Essentially, we will be exploring a couple of two-phase heat transfer technologies. We will discuss passive two-phase heat transfer devices, such as heat pipes and vapor chambers, and then look at active pumped two-phase systems that can manage very high heat loads, both cost and weight, effectively. The focus of today's webinar is on automotive applications for these technologies, but the heat transfer principles we will talk about today can be equally applied across many industries, such as military, aerospace, medical, and alternative energy. Today's automobiles are experiencing trends of increasing power with decreasing packaging size. Vehicles are having a proliferation of electronic componentry, which by some estimates represents around 25% of the total vehicle cost. All of these things, increase in power and electronic functionality and decrease in space, put greater emphasis on the need for advanced thermal management solutions. Automobiles also present a series of additional challenging requirements. First and foremost, the thermal solution must be fundamentally safe and must operate in harsh conditions. These solutions must be manufacturable in an efficient and low-cost manner. They need to provide reliable performance over a long period of time, more than 10 years, and for many applications outside the passenger compartment, they need to be functional over a wide temperature range. Further, they need to be able to, in to withstand intense shock and vibration conditions during operation. The two-phase thermal technologies we will be discussing today have demonstrated performance within all of these criteria, and because we anticipate a growing application of the technologies in new automotive designs, we thought it might be beneficial to explore them in some detail today. Today we will be discussing two two-phase heat transport technologies, passive and active. By two-phase, we are referring to liquid and vapor. The first group, two-phase passive technologies, typically refer to heat pipes and vapor chambers. Inherent advantages of these devices are they require no input power to operate, they provide years of reliable operation, and they operate with virtually no noise. The second group, active pumped two-phase systems, offer important benefits over pumped single-phase liquid design. One important advantage is higher heat transport capability. 
The obvious benefit of the higher heat transport is the ability to handle high heat densities and heat loadings with reduced pump requirements, saving weight and energy while delivering a more uniform temperature across the evaporator surface. We will now examine both of these technologies in a little more detail. But first, back to Billy. Thanks, Pete. In a moment, the following question will appear on your screen. The question is, who does your company use to resolve critical thermal management issues? Your choices are A, in-house resources, B, external experts, C, a combination of both in-house and external resources, or D, not sure. So in a moment, that question will appear on your screen and we'll give you a moment to select your answer by choosing the appropriate button that appears. So again, the question, who does your company use to resolve critical thermal management issues? A, in-house resources, B, external experts, C, a combination of both, or D, not sure. Back to you, Pete. For today's webinar on the passive side, we're going to look at heat pipes as well as some directly related technologies. Heat pipe embedded plates, also called high K plates, and vapor chambers, which are two-dimensional heat pipes. First, we'll look at heat pipes. Heat pipes are sealed vacuum devices. They are housed in a metal tube. Inside the tube is a wick structure and a small amount of a working fluid. Most applications are copper tube, copper mesh, and water, but there are several other envelope material, wick structure, and working fluid combinations. Heat pipes are passive two-phase heat transfer devices that operate in a closed system. To work, a heat pipe must be connected to a hot end or evaporator and a cold end or condenser, as can be seen in the schematic on the left. The difference in temperature between the hot evaporator end and the cold condenser end is the driving force. The heat from the evaporator causes the working fluid to vaporize. Pressure from the vapor pushes it to flow to the cooler end, where it condenses to a liquid. The condensed liquid then returns to the evaporator by capillary force of the wick structure. In the schematic on the right, you can see a cutaway showing the heat pipe structure, including the envelope material, the wick structure, and center vapor path. Fluid inventory control is an important design and processing parameter. Typically, only a small amount of a liquid is used in heat pipes. So now that we know a little bit about heat pipe operation, let's look at how this can be put to use. First of all, with different combinations of envelope materials, wick structures, and working fluids, heat pipes can be used over a wide temperature range, from cryogenic to liquid metal, from around minus 150 to over 1,000 degrees C. We'll look at some high temperature heat pipe options later on. Because they are sealed vacuum devices, some working fluids can operate well beyond their nominal boiling point. Water, for example, can be an effective working fluid from 20 to 250 degrees C. By controlling the amount of working fluid and selecting the appropriate wick structure, heat pipes can restart operation after freezing. They are freeze-thaw tolerant. Also, with the right wick structure, heat pipes can operate against gravity. Typically, heat pipes can transfer heat 8 to 10 inches against gravity, although gravity-aided operation is generally preferred. In terms of advantages, since boiling and condensing are occurring at the same temperature, heat pipes can have an effective conductivity of 10,000 to 200,000 watts per meter Kelvin. We can contrast that with copper, an often used conductor, which has a conductivity of around 400 watts per meter K. Other advantages include continuous passive operation, excellent isothermality characteristics, and quiet operation. In terms of heat flux capabilities, heat pipes can operate with heat fluxes up to 50 to 75 watts per centimeter squared, with custom wicks up to 500 watts per centimeter squared. One of the key benefits of heat pipes is heat transport. Heat pipes can be used to transport heat to external sinks. They can be used, for example, to move heat away from hot engine components to heat sinks, which can be dissipated by airflows while the vehicle is moving. Heat pipes are capable of transferring heat over long distances with minimal delta T. We mentioned typical heat pipes can transfer heat 8 to 10 inches. Gravity-aided and other specialized heat pipes, such as loop heat pipes, can transfer over longer distances. The typical delta T is about 2 to 5 degrees C over the length of the pipe. 
Bending and flattening enables increased geometric flexibility to design. You can see in the picture on the upper right, heat pipes, which are bent in three dimensions, transport heat away from an electronic component to a cold rail. Finally, heat pipes can be used to move heat away from the inside of an enclosure to exterior air cooling without subjecting the components to the outside environment. For example, this is the method used to dissipate heat from the passenger instrument panel. So when should one consider using heat pipes? As we mentioned, heat pipes can be used to both transfer heat and isothermalize components. They should be considered any time high conduction gradients are a major portion of thermal resistance. While removing heat that builds up on electronic components is the classical application for heat pipes, removing excess heat from the engine to enable lower temperature operation and reduce NOx formation is equally effective. In terms of benefits, Heat pipes can be used to reduce the thermal management system side by providing more efficient heat transfer. It can also reduce system weight. Heat pipes are evacuated metal tubes, which are lighter than similar sized metal rods. They can reduce required power. Heat pipes themselves require no power to operate and can decrease system hotspots without need for a pump. And in terms of flexibility, heat pipes can be formed to fit countless geometries. The typical bending radius for a heat pipe is three times the outside diameter, and they can be flattened to two-thirds the outside diameter. An operating heat pipe bent around a penny can be seen in the upper right. One specific application of heat pipes is high K plates. High K plates are aluminum conduction plates with heat pipes embedded in them. Aluminum has a thermal conductivity of around 200 watts per meter K. Typical thermal conductivity for an aluminum high K plate is 500 to 1200 watts per meter K. High K plates can be used to reduce hot spot temperature by moving or spreading heat to less critical areas. They can serve as enhanced conduction cooled cold plates. They are fully compatible with either liquid or air cooled chassis. They can be used to improve fin efficiency and lower fin weight. Pictured on the lower right is an IGBT application where all of the high-powered electrical components were located on one side of the heat sink. Heat pipes were embedded into the plate to move and spread the heat to the other side of the heat sink and get improved fin efficiency. Plate thickness is typically 4 millimeters, but can be thinner. We have made plates as thin as 1.8 millimeter. The structural strength and weight of the high K plate is the same as aluminum. Aluminum silicon carbide can be used instead of aluminum for direct dye attachment applications. A sample ALSIC high K plate is pictured on the upper right. And for reduced weight applications, magnesium can be used in place of aluminum. Shown here is a thermal analysis of an aluminum plate containing several high-powered electrical components with and without embedded heat pipes. Pictured on the far left is a solid aluminum plate without any heat pipes. You can clearly see the three hot spots, two at the top and one at the bottom. Pictured in the middle is that same aluminum plate, but now with heat pipes embedded in them. You can now see that the max temperature has dropped about 20 degrees C and the temperature uniformity has improved greatly. Pictured on the right is the actual plate with the heat pipes embedded in it. The heat pipes can be seen as silver lines. This technology has many heat transport and heat spreading applications and certainly could be considered for improving thermal management for hybrid battery packed base plates. Next we'll talk about vapor chambers. Vapor chambers work similarly to heat pipes but move heat in two directions. As can be seen in the schematic on the right, in vapor chamber operation, high heat flux input causes the working fluid to vaporize. The vapor then spreads in two dimensions. There is wick material all around the inside structure of the chamber. When the vapor reaches the other low flux side, it condenses and returns to the high heat flux area via the wick structure. One of the benefits of vapor chambers is that the vapor heat transport yields nearly perfect isothermal heat spreading, as is illustrated on the low flux side in the right side schematic. 
Here, the temperature across that side of the vapor chamber is highly uniform. So in a sense, a vapor chamber is a heat flux transformer. Vapor chambers are often used in conjunction with heat sinks, taking advantage of their nearly isothermal output and making the heat sink more efficient. Typical components of a vapor chamber heat sink assembly are seen in the lower left. They consist of the vapor chamber wick structure in the middle, a copper envelope seen below, and a heat sink seen at the top. Also pictured is a multiple evaporator, low CTE, coefficient of thermal expansion, high heat flux vapor chamber prepped for direct dye attachment of four chips. As can be seen, vapor chambers can accommodate multiple evaporators. This vapor chamber can accommodate heat fluxes of 700 watts per centimeter squared. We've already stated that heat pipes can operate over wide temperature rain with pop proper selection of working fluid and envelope material. Copper water systems are most common, but with selection of a different envelope material, Monel for example, water can be an effective fluid up to temperatures reaching 250 degrees C. In addition, selection of sodium or potassium can provide heat transfer capability up to 1,000 degrees C and can move kilowatt levels of heat. This can be very advantageous for vehicle engine applications. While the high temperature heat pipes can provide many benefits, in case of a leak or rupture, there may be some potential hazardous chemical reactions. Safety considerations must be addressed. Let's take a look at safety for a minute. Heat pipes are safe and reliable devices, but investigation of what may happen as a result of a catastrophic event needs to be considered, especially in the case of potentially highly reactive working fluids such as sodium. Fortunately, heat pipes are vacuum devices, so upon rupture, initial flow of material will be inward. In cases of small leaks, this will lead to poor performance of the heat pipe, which can be easily detected through temperature monitoring. It should be noted that the amount of working fluid, which is a highly controlled design parameter, is very low, typically only enough to saturate the wick. Further safety measures can be added, such as double-walled envelope and or inclusion of a burst disc, which will collect the working fluid in case of a rupture. So heat pipes can be made to be safe, even in case of major leaks or ruptures. Now it's back to you, Billy. Thanks, Pete. Now in a moment, we'll give you your second question, which should appear on your screen. That second question is, are you facing any thermal management issues in the next A, zero to six months, B, six to 24 months, or C, you're having no immediate issues? So again, we'll give you a moment to select your answer by choosing the appropriate button on your screen. Again, the question is, are you facing any thermal management issues in the next zero to six months, six to 24 months, or are you not having any immediate issues? Back to you, Pete. Thank you. Next, we'll move to active pump two-phase systems. When we talk about active two-phase solutions, we are typically referring to those systems which require input power to operate. Here, we will explain the pump two-phase system, highlighting some of its inherent advantages as well as some challenges. Then we'll look at two recent advancements, microporous mini channels and hybrid two-phase loop which address some of the issues that have been found with pump two-phase systems. Here is a diagram of a generic pump two-phase system. Subcooled liquid is pumped from the bottom of a two-phase condensing reservoir into an evaporator. In the evaporator, the liquid is heated until it reaches its saturation point and starts boiling. The resulting vapor condenses into a pool. The reservoir is designed such that only liquid is provided to the pump. Other radiator designs without reservoirs are possible, but have the potential risk of sending vapor to the pump during transients, such as startup. Two-phase pump loops have several advantages over liquid-cooled loops. The high latent heat of vaporization allows more heat to be absorbed by the fluid, requiring lower flow rates and smaller pumps. The lower flow rates also typically yield smaller overall pressure drops. The thermal uniformity of two-phase cold plates is more uniform since heat is transferred to a fluid at a relatively constant saturation temperature with only the vapor quality changing. 
This compares favorably to the single phase flows, which increase in temperature along the flow paths due to sensible heating of the fluid. Finally, lower, evaporate, lower evaporator thermal resistances are achieved as higher heat transfer coefficients are associated with two phase flow. If two phase flow is so superior, then why hasn't been accepted by the market? Historically, two phase systems are considered more complex than pumped liquid systems requiring more upfront development costs. One clear challenge with this technology is the potential flow instabilities associated with two-phase flow. At the system level, having multiple parallel evaporators can cause flow instability issues if the applied heat flux and pressure drops are improperly balanced. Within the evaporators, bubble forma formation at nucleation sites can be erratic, and these bubbles can create unintended back pressures, which can restrict flow and result in instability and thermal uniformity issues. This is especially evident in microchannel coolers, which have multiple channels in parallel. Recent developments in pump two-phase systems have provided good solutions to these problems and should help accelerate adoption of two-phase cooling in automotive and other applications. Let's look at them. Recent research has shown that flow instabilities within microchannel coolers can be partially attributed to irregular boiling within the channels. The phenomenon occurs because of the relatively high superheats that are required to nucleate bubbles on typical surfaces, resulting in highly explosive, highly transient bubble growth when superheated liquid comes in contact with the nucleation site. The explosive bubble growth leads to back pressure and flow instabilities that cause transient and spatial thermal non-uniformities. Actus developed a technology to reduce two-phase instabilities by creating a surface coating that improves nucleation. The coating creates a porous surface that promotes the formation of nucleation sites and reduces the superheat required to boil. The result is a more stable evaporation process. Here are some results we can share with this approach. In the system, the refrigerant that was used was R134A. Boiling temperature was controlled to 30 degrees C. Heat input on the evaporator was 330 watts per centimeter squared across a 2 centimeter squared area. A picture of the system setup is seen on the lower left. Results can be seen on the right. The top graph shows the system without microporous coating. Temperature variation in the highest heat flux region in the center was measured to be 5.8 degrees C. The graph on the lower right shows the identical setup, but with a porous coating applied to the microchannel area. As can be seen, the temperature variation in the hottest heat flux section was reduced to 1.4 degrees C. In addition, the microporous coating produced a significantly higher heat transfer coefficient and a significantly higher critical heat flux compared to the non-coated sample. Microporous coating of mini channels in the evaporator area is a method to improve performance of pumped two phase systems. Another issue that has been identified with pumped two phase system is the increased complexity with the addition of multiple evaporators. This is an issue especially with multiple high powered IGBTs on the same base plate. One solution to the problem is to separate the functionality of the liquid pumping and then combine it with a passive capillary driven two-phase loop. In this approach, which is diagrammed on the right, a mechanical pump supplies liquid to the evaporator and returns excess liquid to the reservoir. The pump only has to deal with the liquid and can therefore be more reliable and efficient. At the evaporator, the passive capillary driven two-phase loop acquires and delivers large high heat flux loads through vaporization and condensation. The benefits of this approach are many. With a steady supply of liquid, high heat fluxes can be dissipated efficiently. No portion of the system is highly taxed, ensuring robust operation with minimal pumping requirements. A key feature is that the system can accommodate multiple evaporators, each of which can have unique power dissipation requirements. Here is a picture of a hybrid two-phase loop. This one has four 2.5 kilowatt evaporators, which can be seen in the lower part of the picture. System and evaporator specifications for this 10 kilowatt cooling solution are noted on the right. Of equal importance that the system has passed rigorous shock and vibration testing while delivering the high heat dissipation levels. 
So what are the relevant automotive applications for two-phase heat transfer technologies that we have explored today? There are many, but some of the more common ones are hybrid battery thermal management. For low heat dissipation requirements, embedded heat pipes, high K plates, are a good option. They can passively move or spread heat along the battery pack base plate and improve heat dissipation and temperature uniformity. For higher e heat loading, pump two-phase systems can be employed. For good temperature uniformity, the evaporator can have mini channels with a microporous coating. This system will also offer reduced weight and size compared to a single phase pumped liquid system. For many passenger area thermal management solutions, copper water heat pipe assemblies can be implemented. They have been successfully demonstrated to dissipate heat from instrument panels and other electronic devices and have been used to uniformly spread heat across passenger seats and windshield defrost systems. For powertrain and other applications, high temperature heat pipes can be used to dissipate heat from engine components to reduce NOx formation and can be used to recover waste heat from exhaust streams to be utilized elsewhere. Finally, thermal management of high power control electronics, advancements with the hybrid two-phase loop can be used to accommodate plates with multiple IGBTs. So in conclusion, we have presented two advanced thermal technologies which utilize two-phase heat transfer that can be implemented in a variety of automotive applications. The passive two-phase technology, heat pipes, offer advantages of safe, reliable, quiet operation without need of input power. In addition, by utilizing different combinations of working fluids and envelope materials, heat pipes can be used over a broad temperature range. This tech this passive technology has limits on transport distance and power dissipation, but can be implemented to solve a number of automotive thermal management issues and should be used wherever possible. For more demanding heat dissipation requirements, pump two-phase systems are frequently a good solution. From a design perspective, a pump two-phase system will nearly always outperform a pumped liquid system and do so with reduced size and weight requirements. However, perceptions of increased complexity and concerns about temperature instability and difficulty in handling multiple evaporators have hindered broad-based adoption. Recent ad advancement of microporous coatings on the evaporator and development of a hybrid two-phase loop have addressed many of these concerns and should result in increased market acceptance in the automotive industry in the coming years. Thank you very much for your time. Back to you, Billy. Thanks, Pete. At this time, uh, we'd like to begin our Q&A. So if you have a question, you may submit it by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. And also this time, I'd like to welcome onto the line Rich Bonner, Manager of Custom Products, who will help us with the Q&A portion of this presentation. So Rich, we already have uh, some questions in here. We'll have time for a few of them. Uh, here's, here's our first. Can heat pipes recover from a high power transient, which causes the heat pipe to temporarily operate above its capability? So for example, uh, could you consider a power spike from 200 watts up to 2,000 watts for two seconds? Sure, that's actually a, a great question. Um, uh, in short, I would say yes, it is possible for heat pipes to recover from a temporary dry out. Uh, however, I, I would note that it really depends on uh, the amount of margin you have when you're operating at steady state and also the duration of the high power transient operation. There is some limit where you're, if the pulse is, is too long, the evaporator gets too hot, and uh, as the, the liquid in the wick structure tries to re-wet the evaporator, the boiling is just uh, too much to be overcome, so it's not possible. But there are many applications where uh, it is possible to recover from a, a temporary heat spike, uh, as indicated in this question. Rich, is there any equation to calculate the heat conductivity of several heat pipes in a series or in parallel connection? Uh, in short, uh, I'm not um, familiar with any exact equations, uh, and that's mainly due to the number of variables that would be involved. Um, for instance, if you're talking about heat pipes in series, what is the overlap of the heat pipes, what is the diameter of the heat pipes, et cetera, th there's just too many variables. We do, however, have some other simplifications that we can provide. Uh, most commonly, when we have, when we're talking about embedded heat pipe solutions, we can talk about the improvement in the effective thermal conductivity of whatever plate you're embedding your heat pipes. 
Uh, for instance, most people know aluminum and copper have thermal conductivities of 200 and 400 watts per meter K, respectively. Uh, for heat pipes in parallel embedded in those uh, types of materials, typically we see effective conductivities between 600 and 800 watts per meter K. Again, the, there's a, a range there depending on the geometry of the uh, embedded heat pipe plate. Uh, another thing to note is that for vapor chambers, oftentimes we can see effective, conducti effective thermal conductivities exceeding 5,000 watts per meter K and even higher. Okay, Rich, this will have to be our last question. Can heat pipes or vapor chambers be used as a viable alternative to a conventional oil-to-air heat exchanger in an automotive application, and what are the disadvantages? Uh, certainly, I think there are, are uh, you know, being optimistic, I think there's definitely applications where vapor chambers can replace some uh, traditional means of cooling. Uh, I think, you know, the, the person asking the question is, is right, what are the, the disadvantages? I think one of the disadvantages is the uh, relative location of where that radiator is to the heat source. You know, heat pipes and vapor chambers being passive devices can only transport liquid or transport heat so far from the heat source. Uh, however, if you do have room for your heat sink uh, relatively close, you know, within uh, inches, you know, maybe up to 10 inches, 20 inches, those sorts of ranges, I think it is possible to, to look at vapor chambers or heat pipes with heat sinks to replace some of those other traditional cooling mechanisms. Thanks, Rich. That will have to conclude today's webcast. We're out of time. Uh, again, if we did not get a chance to answer your, your questions, we have them, and our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. So thanks to everyone for joining us, and thanks again to Rich Bonner and Pete Ritt. This webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months. Have a great day.